Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Brad, Kevin, and Paul Thiessen. Coming up on DTNS, what is Apple's iPad stage manage feature for exactly? Plus, the U.S. crackdown on Chinese chip making explained. We think you might actually understand it after we talk. And Bono finally apologizes. Just for the iPad, iPod, iPhone thing. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, October 24th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. From the Atlanta area, I'm Nika Montfort. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, Sarah Lane did help produce this show today, uh, but she's uh, had to step away, among other things, a Verizon issue. So I uh, imagine we'll hear all about that tomorrow. However, for now, let's start with a few tech things you should know. The Quick Hits. On Monday, the European Union gave its final approval to require companies to switch to USB-C on a variety of devices. This will make a USB-C port mandatory for devices, including iPhones and AirPods, by the end of 2024. 20 days after being published in the official journal of the European Union, Classic Journal, the rules will apply exactly 24 months later. So get all of your calendars in order. As we've mentioned on previous coverage, all products that go on sale before that date will be exempt and can continue to be sold after that point. Yeah. Then there's the whole laptop thing has a later date and it's it's yeah. complex, but you, you got time. That's the point, right? <laughs> uh, PayPal's rolling out pass keys for users in the United States, letting them log into their PayPal accounts without having to type in credentials. The new option comes to users at first with iPhones, iPads, and Macs, but will expand to additional platforms that support other things uh, as they come. Google released initial pass key support for Android and Chrome earlier this month and says it will launch the stable version with an API for native Android apps before the end of the year. PayPal will open up pass key support to other countries starting in early 2023. Meta is threatening to keep Canadians from sharing news content in response to Canada's proposed Bill C-18 legislation introduced earlier this year. As it's known, the Online News Act wants platforms like Meta's Facebook, you may have heard of it, to enter into revenue sharing partnerships with local news organizations, not unlike Australia's News Media Bargaining Code, which passed in early 2021. Meta said last Friday it wanted to be, quote, transparent about the possibility that we may be forced to consider whether we continue to allow the sharing of news content in Canada. Nothing qualified in that sense. Yeah, I think they can only mean on Facebook, not all the sharing of news, uh, one would think. Uh, The Republican National Committee has filed a lawsuit against Google in the U.S. District Court in California, alleging the company discriminates against it by sending its campaign emails to Gmail users' spam folders more often than it does the email messages from other political organizations. In September, Google launched an opt-in pilot program that lets political parties keep their campaign meals on a campaign meals campaign emails unaffected by gmail spam detection but the rnc has not enrolled in that program uh instead choosing to file the lawsuit youtube began rolling out new design and features so be on the lookout for these all users are getting pinch to zoom on videos that's been in testing with premium subscribers since august now will be available to all users that's rolling out the apple also get more precise seeking showing a frame by frame view when scrubbing through video a welcome addition the web version and apple also get a new ambient mode when viewing in dark mode which will use dynamic color sampling to change the app's background color based on what you're viewing. As for UI changes, links in video descriptions will now appear as buttons rather than hypertext. The iconic subscribe button is now rounded and is in high contrast color rather than always in red, and other buttons have been changed to minimize distractions. Yeah, I like that pinch to zoom stuff. That's pretty good. All right, let's talk about Apple. Apple refreshed its iPad lineup last week, and whenever we get new iPads, the question of what are iPads for crops up. Uh, Well, iPad OS 16.1 is out today, and one of its features, Stage Manager, is a new way of handling multitasking on the tablet that could change the answer to the question of what iPads are for. Yeah. Yeah. When it's turned on, Stage Manager puts the app you're using at the center, what it calls the stage, I guess the stage that you're managing. Your four most recent apps are then put off to the left in piles 
and you can add to your pile from apps in your docs to kind of amalgamate everything kind of in workloads there. Stage Manager has faced problems in beta all summer long, hence the iPad OS update coming later than the iOS update. We're at 16.1 after all. So I guess, was it worth the delay? Is everything sorted out now? The Verge's David Pierce says no, it was not <laughs> worth the delay. It's not sorted out. Uh, Pierce found that if you live in a handful of apps, the system works well enough. But if you use more than a few apps, uh, and here's a quote from Pierce, trying to figure out how Stage Manager works turns into a wild puzzle requiring a wall of Polaroids and a ball of yarn. <laughs> I assume that's metaphorical, but I'm not sure. Uh, piles of apps became hidden when using more than four, and you don't know which version of an app will open if it's in multiple piles. In other words, if, let's say, you've got uh, the Word app in two piles and you tap on the Word icon, it could open either one of those piles. It's a fun little game. You don't know which one it's going to do. Uh, this comes on top of software stability with multiple apps either crashing or not offering sufficient views to make half screen views usable. He said it works great if you have three iPhone sized screens on your iPad. That was the one nice thing he said. Yeah. Basically, <laughs> amongst that, the other thing that kind of worked well was just the app switcher in general in Stage Manager is also just, just kind of nice, but not exactly a glowing review. And this is, since the first beta, kind of been a known issue. I'm, I mean, you know, Anika, have you had a chance to uh, to play with this? And uh, you know, does does this point to, I guess, any new functionality that we can expect for the iPad if this ever does get sorted out? So I haven't had a chance to play with it. I was trying to get uh, it installed before I came on today, but surprisingly, when I checked the first thing this morning, none of the new software had been released. Uh, so I was just able to check maybe an hour or so ago and I did see it. So I haven't had the chance to play with it yet. And I'm getting a new iPad Pro later this week okay. when they launch. So we'll see if there's really any difference in the way Stage Manager works on the new hardware. I, you know, it's hard to guess. Possibly it could be better on the new iPad. I'm not sure. I'll, you know, kind of do a little test to see on my old iPad Pro and on my new one, how it necessarily works. I think what Apple was trying to do was to find another way to multitask that is going to be easier for the user to use. And I kind of thought of it as if you think of Microsoft PowerPoint, when you're doing a presentation, you can go into presentation mode and you have your main slide that you're talking from in the center. Then you have all of your other slides on the side so you can see what's coming up. You can kind of prep that way. That's kind of how I look at Stage Manager, but it sounds like um, some people are not very impressed so far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it sounds like, and and Pierce does a good job getting into this, this piece that Apple's main focus with the iPad, with iPad OS, is always on that like single screen immersive experience. It's just like the DNA of an iPad, and everything needs to be, ex you know, you can build extensions off of that experience. So you can have the app that takes, you know, your stage, and then have your piles that you can kind of move in and out of. But it seems like the choice between having kind of windowed chaos. Uh, that you might have on a, on a desktop operating system and whatever stage manager, you know, task switching plus on a stage manager. And it, it seems like it's a unhappy medium or maybe it's that we're still uh, figuring out if a if and what a an actual like tablet native uh, like task switching window management system really looks like. I, I know these aren't easy problems to have, but, right. it, you know, it, it's it. it a lot of these design principles have been hashed around before. I mean, this is a, this is a very web OS kind of style system that they have going on here. Obviously, did a lot you more did you call did you call uh, the the typical operating system interface that we've had since the '90s windowed chaos? Yeah, windowed chaos. Yeah, I feel like, I feel like you have a little little apple Kool Aid on your chin there. You no, just might so, so I will say this. I think part of the also problem is on Mac OS the window management on there is also trash. I say this as I'm on a Mac right now and it's hot garbage <laughs> and it's the worst experience ever compared. Like Windows gets it. Windows 100% gets window management a thousand times percent better 
than Mac OS. I think they just don't know what good window management is. And they brought <laughs> maybe, it to the iPad. maybe <laughs> so, and Steve, Steve Jobs historically hated uh, the idea of multiple windows. He, he thought it ruined your focus, which is one of the reasons that iOS and iPad OS particularly do not have windowed management. Steve Wozniak uh, was still around when they first added windowed management. They took it from Xerox Park in the 80s. And I wonder if Jobs regretted that uh, because he really was about you know, like full screen, immersive, multitasking meant the ability for something to refresh in the background. And then when you switch to it, it was up to date. That's what it meant for Jobs. Uh, this is is some weird amalgam that doesn't want to give us what we want, which is resizable multiple windows on a tablet uh, and 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 some kind of like uh, compromise to not be full screen, but, but be kind of still immersive and kind of still giving you focus. Uh, the thing that really stands out is very un-Apple-y to me here yes. is that the minimize command can mean different things in different situations in stage manager. In one case, minimize means take it out of the bundle. In another case, it just means minimize the entire bundle. And you have to know as a user which case you're in, which is not the way Apple usually does things. And also I'll say one thing that is kind of out of the ordinary for Apple, they usually don't put something out unless it's fully baked. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't seem to be the case even with the delay. So it, in, in normal times, if something is delayed, you expect that when it does roll out, it is in the final form. And it appears that that's not the case, which is very uncharacteristic of Apple. Yeah. The, the most damning thing about this is that it's off by default. When have you ever known Apple to be like, we want to let our users slowly no. roll into this? Like they Apple want to tell normally you how to just use the device. It would be more Apple-y for Apple to be like, oh, stage manager isn't launching in 16.1. No, and give no explanation, yeah. right? That yeah, I right. would expect, I'd be like, ah, typical Apple. Putting something in that's off by default and that is not working properly, unusual. And a marquee feature. Steve Jobs but wouldn't yeah. be happy. Mm -hmm. I imagine there's a lot of people in there that are, are not happy right now. I don't know. I, I have a use for a tablet. It is very full screen though. It's like, oh, things I want to do mobile, but I need a bigger screen for. Um, I feel like in a future where we get resizable screens that work somehow, whether it's foldable or rollable, I don't know, know that I don't need a tablet because I just need that bigger screen sometimes, often for video watching, but sometimes for other things. I don't know if I need an iPad or a tablet of any kind as a PC or a laptop replacement. Well, speaking of things that didn't make people happy, it seems like price increases for streaming content is the new adding a plus to your name. After we've seen increases from YouTube, Disney Plus, and Hulu, Apple is raising the price of Apple Music by $1 a month to $10.99 and Apple TV Plus by $2 to $6.99. Apple also raised the price of Apple One, which bundles music and TV Plus with other services, by $2 to $16.95 a month. Annual and family plans will also increase. Apple said music licensing costs have risen and that it raised the price of Apple TV Plus because of the increased selection. There's just so much great content on there. You'll want to pay for more, right, Tom? Oh, yeah. Um, I guess. I don't know. $6.99 <laughs> still seems pretty reasonable compared to what the prices are for these other things. $4.99 was a screaming deal, uh, especially with what Apple has in there now. Uh, and, and I get... I get the reasoning of we only had a few shows at launch, so we kept it cheap. Now we're raising it. Uh, I also get that inflation is rampant everywhere and the cost of everything is going up, which is going to have knock on effects like this. Uh, I, I guess the way I come at it, Nika, is is Apple TV Plus still worth $6.99 a month, given what they have? Is, is it still worth that much? To me, it is. I yeah. I think we're going to die a death by you know small <laughs> increases. It's like they'll they'll nickel and dime. You know, everyone's nickel and diming you. We'll add you know a dollar here, a dollar there. When you think about it, oh, that's not that much money until we get up to sixteen ninety nine instead of six ninety nine. But I think at this point. Um, they were smart to keep it low initially because they were a new platform and they didn't have a lot of content. Now it's some really great content coming out of Apple TV Plus. So, you know, in the grand scheme of things with everybody, you know, raising prices by a dollar or two, it it makes sense. Yeah. 
And uh, Beat Master asked a good question in the chat. Inflation for digital goods seems so weird. Uh, it, it does seem like, well, wait, the price, you don't, you don't need gas to deliver me <laughs> Apple music. You know, why Why are those prices going up? But it's it's a chain of effects, right? Uh, yeah. The price of gas makes it more expensive to, to do business. Uh, labor shortages make the wages increase. Also, the price of gas and food going up means that there's pressure to increase the wages to keep up with it, which raises your operating costs, which means you have to raise your prices elsewhere, which is how that all ends up happening. Yeah, the, yeah. the one thing I, I think that will uh, th there's two things that is, I think most people won't notice this all that much. I don't want to say that a price increase is, is you know, it's not a big deal. It's, it's people's hard earned money. But a lot of times, especially with Apple stuff, their subscriptions are very often rolled into other things. Buy a new iPhone, you get three months of Apple Arcade or you get a Apple TV, buy some AirPods, you get some stuff. People are upgrading those on multiple cycles. And if they're riding those offers, they might not actually see these charges all that much. And depending on what carrier you're on, they have all sorts of things that are rolled into their uh, as well, where, you know, if you are on a certain Verizon plan or T-Mobile plan, you get certain uh, of these music services and stuff. Oh, yeah, I got Apple TV well. Plus as part of my T-Mobile. Yeah. yeah. So you, so, you know, depending this, this may not impact you now, the price of your Verizon bill may go up next year or next month or something like that. That may happen down the road uh, as well. But the other thing is the one thing that they didn't say is this is the Apple TV plus ad supported tier, as opposed to every other service that we talked about, which is clamoring and, and thirsting and rushing as headlong fast as possible to throw ads in there so that they can offer a lower price tier and 699 still comes in under Netflix and Disney plus with a smaller catalog, admittedly. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think it's interesting that they gave reasons for these, <laughs> these price increases. Uh, a lot of times people just raise prices. So, yeah. All right, folks. Uh, if you have ideas of what you'd like to hear us talk about on the show, we'd love to hear them. One way to let us know is our subreddit. We look at that every single day. I uh, appreciate uh, everybody supporting us in there. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Well, the United States crackdown on chip technology in China is having significant effects. This fight, of course, isn't new. It's more than 10 years old at this point. In October 2012, the U.S. House issued a bipartisan report accusing ZTE and Huawei of stealing intellectual property and threatening U.S. national security because of its ties to the Chinese government and its military. ZTE made the entity list in 2016, and not to be left out, Huawei made it in 2019. Those lists require a license to sell them certain tech. A license you weren't likely to get in all, you know, probability. ZTE had its restrictions eased, but Huawei still labors under them, having to spin off its, its consumer phone unit, Honor, in order to survive. Although Honor's doing much better uh, since the spin out, at least. Yeah, uh, but the fight with Huawei and ZTE wasn't about phones. Uh, it was about networking equipment, and the fight has now expanded to include most of China's domestic chip-making industry. So not just the chips in network routers, but the chips in all the things. Uh, the U.S. now requires a license in order to export a long list of advanced chip-making hardware and software to a long list of entities in China. Uh, they really are targeting things that could be used for AI or any kind of surveillance technology, anything they think might, even if that's not its major use, might end up helping the military. So the license requirements not only apply to U.S. companies, but they also apply to companies outside the U.S. who are using U.S.-owned intellectual property in their chip making. So for example, if Taiwan's TSMC, which is a Taiwanese company, it's not based in the U.S., doesn't, doesn't work within the United States jurisdiction, but if that company is using a U.S.-designed piece of equipment to build a part, it can no longer sell that part to the restricted entities in China without a license. Now, these rules don't affect everything. For example, South Korea's Samsung and SK Hynix can continue to have their chips made at plants in China. Apple can continue to make its iPhones and even sell those phones in China. The restrictions are meant really specifically to stop Chinese companies that may have connections to the Chinese government from using U.S. tech to make and develop its own chips. If you are, you know, uh, primarily serving or, or you're you're one of these other companies, you we've seen it. We've seen SK Hynix explicitly say they've gotten exemptions from it, and it's 
you know, presumed on a lot of other uh, kind of westward facing organizations as well. Yeah, there's a little bit of having their cake and eating it, too. Uh, they they want to stop China's domestic industry. Wall Street Journal notes that this works well because the U.S. still dominates the design and development end of chip tech. So NVIDIA, Qualcomm, AMD and Intel, those are all U.S. companies, and they make up 67 percent of the logic chip design market. Uh, so that's that intellectual property they can they can wield about. China has a company called High Silicon uh, and a few others, but they still only make up 5% of that market. Chip design software is all, also dominated by the US. Cadence and Synopsys have 74% of the market. China has 3% of that market. The US even owns the plants. The US has fabricators like Applied Materials and KLA making up 41% of the fabrication market. China has 2%. Others come from Taiwan, Korea, Japan, and Europe. China's advantage is location. It's the place where the factories are. So China has 14% of chip fab locations and 46% of assemblers, packagers, and testers where the chips come together into parts. The U.S. has 2%. These U.S. regulations are letting companies continue to take advantage of building and assembling things for a cheap price in China, but they're hindering the ability of Chinese companies domestically developing technologies and making chips for themselves. Yeah, and the new rules don't stop at hardware and software either. They prevent U.S. persons from supporting China's chip development and production without a license as well. Dozens of Chinese chip company executives will either have to give up U.S. citizenship or quit their jobs. China's leading domestic chip maker YMTC has asked all U.S. citizens working for it to resign. YMTC chief executive Simon Yang, who has a U.S. passport, stepped down as CEO last month, and he may give up his remaining role as deputy chair. The policies are having an effect too. For example, a company called Byron Technologies, B-I-R-E-N, makes a general purpose GPU that some people are thinking might outperform the NVIDIA A100, uh, a chip you can no longer legally send to China without a license. You'd think that would be a bright spot for China. Oh, hey, we're competitive here. However, Taiwan's TSMC makes the chip for Byron and has halted production of the Byron GPU while it determines if the chip indeed performs well enough to fall under U.S. restrictions. Yeah, and that's just one example. I mean, the numbers are just bad overall. This really popped out to me uh, this morning, putting together Daily Tech headlines. China's chip imports fell 12.4% in September on the year, and then domestic chip output also fell 16.4% in September. So China's bringing in fewer chips and making fewer chips compared to last year. It's like over 90 billion chips. I did the math. I've got a calculator. Some of this is economics, of course, but not all of it. Yeah. All, and But all of it bodes not well for China's aim of chip self-sufficiency. Uh, nevertheless, it's not going to dissuade China's president, Xi Jinping, who was just confirmed for a third term as leader of the Communist Party. He is the first person to get a third term since Mao. He will be elected to a third term as president in March. That's a formality. Xi also created a central committee of loyalists, moving anyone from other factions out. So don't look for any moderating forces there. In his address to the party congress last week, Xi called for the country to win the battle in core technologies. And of course, none of this will help the chip shortage, which is slowly teetering towards something like easing. But every time it does, something like a war, shooting, or trade seems to complicate matters and further extend the drought just over time. Yeah. Uh, I, I think some of the things that surprised me looking at this is I thought more fabrication took place in China. 14% is still puts it as the leader, uh, but fabrication is spread out a lot more across Korea, Japan, uh, Brazil, India, uh, Mexico, uh, a lot more places than I think people realize. It's the assembly, it's the packaging, it's the testing that is most concentrated in China. And that is the part of the process that is the easiest under these regulations to let continue. Yeah, and and from a, someone who is not uh, uh, well, like extraordinarily well versed in like international commerce and diplomacy, I mean, I remember when 2012 and 2016, you know, when we saw these companies being put on the entity list and thinking, this is this is like like Huawei is done, like they can't. How I don't know how they as a company continue and not realizing the the kind of 
the chess pieces that are on the board internationally for yeah, the yeah. U.S. and China to continue this uh, uh, going forward is is really been uh, informative to watch just from someone from kind of the outside from just a pure tech background. Well, the Guardian had a uh, a really interesting. Oh, sorry, Nika, did you have something before no. we move on? No, I was just going to say what it, it kind of you know stood out to me is that the fact that we thought we were on the other side of the chip shortage issue. And um, it appears <laughs> as if we're not, the chips are still hot. <laughs> every every time we think we're past it, there's oh, something else, something else comes up. Exactly. Uh, all right. uh, the Guardian had an interesting interview with Bono uh, on lots of things related to U2 and, and the, the whole music scene, but he touched on the... Uh, the fact that YouTube's music showed up in an iTunes library without you wanting it. Uh, Bono says, blame me, it's my fault. Uh, he explains how back in 2004, a month before the band's single Vertigo was released, uh, U2's manager Paul McGinnis, Jimmy Iovine, Edge, and Bono paid a visit to Steve Jobs in Palo Alto where they suggested Apple offer a black and red U2-themed iPod, which they did. Ten years later, when Tim Cook was Apple CEO, U2 came back and said, hey, why don't you give away music for our Songs of Innocence album uh, and, and we'll, we'll pay for it, but, but people won't have to pay for it. As Bono describes it, on September 9th, 2014, we didn't just put our bottle of milk at the door, but in every fridge, in every house in town. In some cases, we poured it on to the good people's cornflakes, and some people like to pour their own milk, and others are lactose intolerant. Uh, so he understands that it wasn't that it was free that people objected to. It was that it was forced into your library. Uh, Bono says the band quickly realized they'd opened up a serious discussion about the access of big tech to people's lives. As many of you will recall, Apple provided a way to delete the album. And Tim Cook told Bono, you talked us into an experiment. We ran with it. It may not have worked, but we have to experiment because the music business in its present form is not working for everyone. Do you forgive Bono, Nika? I guess it's it's been a while now. It's fine. We I survived. I survived it. So sure, I forgive you, Bono. There you go. For this this is a big <laughs> moment for Bono. I think we've all finally forgiven him. Well, I don't know, Rich. I, you know what, in my, because somehow in Bono describing talking to two CEOs of Apple and getting exclusive rights to distribute his album to literally every iPhone user sounds somehow down to earth also. So just for mm. that, I, I forgive him for that feat of linguistics. I, I liked his metaphor. I like that he owned he owned it and said it was my fault. I poured the milk in your cornflakes. I shouldn't have done that. I'm like, yeah, that's good. I also, I don't like milk on my cornflakes. So, you know, I wouldn't like it if Bono came into my house and bought me cornflakes, which I don't have, and then poured milk on them. And who let Bono in the house? I didn't. Yeah, I didn't please get in, Bono. Bono. <laughs> yeah. Edge. No problem. Bono. Yeah, got a cool hat. Mm. The glasses. Get him out of here. Yeah. All right. Let's check out the mailbag. All right. We had In Yang. He sent an email regarding last Thursday's episode. And he said on Uber showing ads. Will the driver be able to turn off the screen or will, the, will there be a penalty if the ride is active and the screen is off? I usually request for the radio or music to be turned off anytime I take a taxi or a ride share just to have a little bit of silence. And for video, I get car sick, at least when I'm not dry, uh, when I'm not doing the driving, which a video within my sight line will make work at worse. And he's in Lagos, Nigeria. So in Yang, thank you so much uh, for writing in. Yeah, good question. Uh, I, I didn't see any clarification what you'll be able to do to that screen during your ride that's showing you the ad. If it's anything like taxis, uh, Sarah was telling us in, in, in our pre-show prep that you know she was out in New York recently uh, for a wedding and the taxis still have those those video players in the seats, but you can turn the volume down. You can't turn the screen off, but you can turn the volume uh, down. Uh, hopefully the Uber ones would, would at least give you that much so you don't have to have the noise blaring at you. Um, I, I don't know, Dika, have you ever run on those taxis with the things blaring, talking at you? Yeah, and honestly, because everything is about selling ads, everything is about somebody trying to sell you something, I would be surprised if Uber would give you those types of accommodations. I think at this point they realize that they have a large uh, chunk of the market share and it's like, well, you're going to get these ads and, and like it. Yeah. 
It reminds me of that Netflix series Maniac, the ad system, the crazy ad system they had in there. I don't know if you've seen that. It's just like no. people yelling ads at you constant. You can't like you have to and it's like at the gas and it's like at and it's like at the gas station if you're getting gas. Oh. I know at least here they mm. show like the the five day forecast. Yeah. yeah, and it's yeah. so Thanks, loud. Cheddar. And it's like I'm just trying to get some gas. I'll be here mm-hmm. five minutes. I pay the three cents more a gallon just to opt out of it. Like let me pay more for the gas to opt out of that, please. <laughs> I don't know. I, I I used to. I might have said that a few months ago. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not sure anymore. We're at Midwest. Office now, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Nika Monford, uh, for being with us as always. Lots of Apple stuff to talk about today. If you like hearing Nika talk about Apple stuff, well, there's a whole show of that. Absolutely. You can head on over to snobblewest.com to get all of the details. We talk all things Apple and some other tech as well. And this week's show is probably going to be pretty busy because lots of dro- things were dropped today and will be dropping on Wednesday. Excellent. Go check it out, folks. It's a good show. Thank you, Nika. And thank you to our brand new boss, Glenn, who just started backing us on Patreon. Glenn, yes, the, the hordes of grateful people are all applauding you. Thank you, Glenn. That's all for you, Glenn. And it could be all for you tomorrow, uh, including extra extra technology news, columns, and and bonus material at patreon.com slash DTNS. Patrons, stick around because one of the things you get is the extended show, Good Day Internet. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow, talking Google's Pixel 7, 7 Pro, and Pixel Watch with Shannon Morse. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs) 